just kind of a breakdown of his at-bats um, at the AAA level. So he's had 126 hits and 390 at-bats, 126 hits, 27 home runs, 90 RBI. He's hit 323. On base percentage is 431. Wow. He's slugged over 1,000. One, two. Swinging a drive toward right center. Back goes Robert. Back near the stands. That ball is gone. A game winning home run for Chris Morrell. Can you believe it? Listen to this crowd. Welcome back to the Brotherly Cubs podcast. I'm Zach, joined as always by John. And we've got some insane news to report even though it was a few days ago michael bush and yensei amante traded to the cubs we also want to talk about cubs con and talk about some additional moves so a lot going on today and we're excited for other stuff uh first news that cubs con is this was this weekend it ends today recording on sunday as it is cold across the nation snow is postponing nfl games it's cold here in Texas. I'm sure it's cold in California. It's insane. We're here with the winter weather, and we've luckily got some hot stove to break up the cold weather. Uh, but first, CubsCon happened. And let me just say this. Cody Bellinger was the topic of the Cubs convention. He's all over the board, and everyone loves him. Everyone wants him to come back. So, uh I wasn't planning to do a deep dive on the Cubs con, but I know you and I both want to go. It sounds pretty awesome. I looked at sort of who's who's going. I didn't realize how massive this thing is. It's not even just current players. It's former players. It's legends, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I think it's pretty sweet. And a couple other quick notes here. As reporters had a chance to talk to Jed Hoyer and Craig Council, Council Threw a little bit of shade at David Ross saying that he would not bunt in any games. He doesn't like to bunt. That was kind of a fun little, you know, thing tossed across the way at, at Rossi. Also right. that he would hit his best hitters higher up in the lineup. So he would not hit Bellinger fourth, for instance. That's probably what one of our major complaints of, of Rossi all season is that Bellinger is hitting further down. So a lot of nice marks from Council. He also talked about Hayden Wesneski a little bit. When Jed Hoyer was prompted, he unfortunately talked about a small market mentality being a good thing, but it's not necessarily the worst thing to have if you can make you know a lot of value from those deals, um, even though it might make you a little bit more attentive to make deals in general. That's definitely how it's felt, and that kind of lines up with what we've seen. He mentioned that the Cubs get thrown around on the radar a lot for players, even just as a you know, in order to garner interest from agents uh, to get interest from players. That makes a lot of sense. Big market teams get thrown around. I'm sure the Yankees, Dodgers, and Mets, the same thing happens. He also mentioned that the Cubs are in the fourth or fifth inning of the offseason and that they still have a few more moves to make. So even though he feels like they're halfway through, they've still got a few more moves to make. And the last point we'll make about Cubs Con that – I'm sure will be a point of discussion on this pod is they, they, uh, Jed Hoyer feels that the Cubs want to add more guys who can hit righties. Now, does that mean just lefties or does it mean righties that are solid splits across the board? That might still open the door for Hoskins, but um, definitely lefties was the topic of conversation as well. And that brings us to a trade the Cubs made for a left-handed infielder, power hitter, Michael Bush. Cubs trade with the Dodgers for Yancey Almonte and Michael Bush. And the funny thing was Almonte was the first news that broke on Twitter. I like to call it Twitter. John calls it X. Technically the name's X, but I'm reminiscent of the olden days of just a couple years ago when Elon Musk did not buy the website. Yancey Almonte was the first news that broke in the trade. And then it, more news came out that Michael Bush was completely in the deal which is incredible. I will say that Bush was blocked by the Dodgers. The Cubs give up Jackson Ferris, who is a top 10 prospect across the board, just for sure by MLB pipeline. Some had him as high as number five. Jackson Ferris becomes the Dodgers' number fifth prospect. The other player the Cubs give up is Zaire Hope, who was a an 11th round pick, who was given about fifth or sixth round money, which is called an over slot signing. The funny thing about this trade is that 
Jackson Ferris was also given overslot money, and Cade Horton was given underslot money. So the Cubs saved money on Horton's first round pick, um, and they overspent on Jackson Ferris's picks. They felt Ferris is more of a first round type guy. We've talked about Horton a lot. We know he's coming up to the bigs pretty soon, definitely this year. We can talk about that another day, but I feel like by the middle of the season, he's going to be knocking on the door, especially if there's any injuries at all. So just to break down this deal, Jackson Ferris pitched only at low A. For some reason, I thought he had moved up to, to South Bend. Um, an important thing about drafting a player that young, Jackson Ferris was drafted at age 18. He was last year's was age 19 season in 2023. He'll, so he'll be 20. This is a age 20 season. Jackson Ferris should have technically gone at his young age to the Arizona Complex League. That's where Zaire Hope had played and put up some decent numbers in a small sample. I'm sure Zaire Hope eventually would have been blocked because there's tons of Cubs outfield prospects. I think we like that part of the trade is that they traded an outfielder. However, Jackson Ferris was the star of this deal from the Cubs. Last year at Myrtle Beach, low A affiliate for the Cubs. He had a 3.38 ERA and 56 innings pitched, 77 strikeouts. He did have a 1.21 whip, but at 179 opponents average against, which means he was limiting hard contact and hits in general, but he had 33 walks. So one of the concerns about Ferris was his high walk rate, 33 walks and 56 innings pitched. The 77 strikeouts is a lot to like. I mean, that's definitely more, it's almost one and a half hitters per inning. So they were for sure getting, you know, a guy who's striking out hitters at a high level. Um, it's unfortunate that they get they give up such a good prospect, but he's still, you know, two to three years away from being an impactful starter in the Cubs. And if 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 they end up getting enough from this pitching infrastructure. Who knows if Ferris would have been a back end or more of a reliever type pitcher for the Cubs when he did come up. The Dodgers gave up Yancey Almonte, career 4.51 ERA. Seemed like he was good every other year based on his numbers. 22% career strikeout rate, 10% career walk rate. I'd like to see the strikeout rate a little bit higher or the walk rate a little lower. In his good seasons, those numbers tend to go the opposite direction in a good fashion. In 2022, he had a 1.02 ERA. Last year, he had 5.06 ERA, so the Dodgers turned him into a solid reliever. Last year, they couldn't get as much out of him. I believe he was injured a bit. And final note, Almonte, uh, almost nine Ks per inning, so he strikes out almost one batter per inning. He has a sweeper slider that is nasty, and he has a sinker that averages between 95 and 97, so he's more of a power pitcher. John, any notes on uh, Michael Bush? From the Dodgers. Yeah, I just doing a little bit of research on him. Keith Law had him as number 74 on his top 100 prospects. Um, he's had three seasons in double A AA and triple A. The last three years, he's had 79 home runs. Um, so he projects to be more of a doubles guy. So I hit a lot of doubles with about 18 to 22 home runs at the major league level. Um, first baseman, just from my perspective, from the Cubs side of things. Um, hit 241 as um, for first baseman. So that includes Mervis, Wisdom. So people like that, they've hit 27th in, in, in the Major League Baseball. So um, on-base percentage is 27th and then 22nd in RBIs. Um, and then, so the, he's, he's definitely going to be a welcome addition to the first base uh, core. Right. And I got to wonder if I know the Cubs wanted to bring Bellinger back. That was a major topic of Cubs convention. I do think right out the gate, if the Cubs sign Bellinger, first of all, I think Bellinger is the next major league move to fall. And I think uh, on opening day, Bellinger would be the center fielder. Now, if we were talking about uh, when PCA is up, that's we talk about this quite a bit when PCA is up and hitting and he's starting the center fielder. Who cares if he's lead off or ninth? He's in the lineup and he's taking care of center. One would think that, you know, okay, the Cubs re-signed Bellinger. He's a good defender. He's going to play first. So do we think that moves Bush to DH? What do we think that does to Bush's place in the lineup? I think Bush could be a replacement or a, he could sub in for Cody Bellinger if Cody Bellinger signs with the Cubs. I think he will eventually sign. 
Um, but he could spell him or even Horner um, as a just kind of as a backup to either one of those guys whenever they need a break. Um, just kind of a breakdown of his at bats um, at the Triple A level. So he's had 126 hits and 390 at bats, 126 hits, 27 home runs, 90 RBI. He's hit 323. On base percentage is 431. Wow. He's over a thousand, so a thousand forty-nine. <laughs> so OPS, you mean? Uh, or, or sorry, um, OPS, yeah. Okay, so he's slugging like over five hundred, right? Five uh, or six hundred. Yeah, something like that. It's got to be yeah, because you wow. add this is slug. So slug, if I'm doing that off the cuff, it's at least um fifty-seven or fifty-eight or five eighty. Wow. It's about it's about five seven five five eighty. Yeah. Three hundred ninety so, at really best. Last year. off the ball. He's got great defense. Um, you know it what? Just seems like yeah. This is an incredible. I don't want to say it's like a one to one parallel with Mervis, but I know Mervis also struggled at the bigs last year. Similar, yeah. similar amount of at bats, maybe at the major league level. Lefty power bat. Twenty. I like, love the twenty seven home runs. Um, yeah. Also, he, yeah. So what I do I, like. Did you say he had a four thirty one on base? 431 on base yeah that's crazy <laughs> that is crazy i mean it's like really really good i mean you you would hope for anything and you know three what 380s uh 390 i mean that'd be for still sure. really decent if you're even getting on base that at that, that clip um he is kind of like a more highly touted mervis um from what i'm hearing around right. the league um and this is at 390 at bats um mervis i think hit 22 home runs and I think it was 360 at bats. So he had about 30 games or 30 at bats less um than than uh than Bush. So they're comparable, they're very comparable. My thoughts going forward are what does that mean for Mervis? Obviously, you know, oh. <laughs> Gary, right? You got Hayden oh. as well. So I mean, I mean, he's not gonna be knocking at the door probably anytime soon, but um you you could also you know package him package Mervis and maybe Triantos and another prospect for maybe right. a deal, in a deal like for Class A or or Bieber but who knows I guess we'll see what the future holds for for those guys. Yeah, I have so many thoughts about. Unfortunately, it's only made the the Cubs offseason. I don't want to say more complicated because they did need left handed hitting. Uh, I do think that. It, it now really puts them in a position to trade. And, and then I keep going back and forth. What do you do with Bush or Morrell is one of them. Bush, so from the numbers you mentioned, what we really like to see is a is if we like to see a high average, like to see the OPS is a big number. For the audience that isn't aware, a high average is is, is good, but also when you're on base percentage, we, we were like, wow, was if, it, if it's 100 points better than your batting average, I mean, that's what gets your OPS up there. Slug does too. You can have a good OPS and not, you know, draw that many walks or not, you know, get that many singles and get, you know, have a high average. You can slug the heck out of the ball. But if you can do all of it, you know, get get base hits, power, get you said doubles. The Cubs are good for doubles. If you can hit a lot of doubles and hit sort of think about alley to alley, Wrigley is a little bit better if you can hit into the alleys. So that, that's good. That's good for Bush if he's able to hit into the alleys because when the wind blows out, he'll get some of those doubles will stretch into home runs. But also, I like the fact that he's got a high walk rate if he's walking that much. Mm -hmm. I don't have the strikeout rate in front of me, I, but I, I, from what I remember seeing recently this week was it was actually pretty decent. It wasn't high. I, I, obviously, he's not... He hasn't hit at the majors, but he's hit, you know, he's sporadically up. So he wasn't up consistently last year. I'm curious to see how he'll do with a full season, that confidence. So he, so he had, um, looking at 2023, uh, he had 618 was his slugging. Wow. Yeah. And that's a triple A. Yeah, it's a triple A. So I mean, obviously, you know, there's an adjustment when you get to, when you get to the major league level, so. I'm yeah, I mean I'm penciling him in at least an 800 OPS and uh, it'll be interesting to see the competition between Bush and Morrell and and really if the Cubs do sign Bellinger, I could see that being a domino in, in Bush's career could be, you know, can he learn to play third base? Another note I actually am reminded of uh as we talked about Cubs convention. Matt Shaw was at Cubs Con 
And he talked about one of his quotes was he spent 99% of his reps this off season taking ground balls at third base. Yeah, So I saw that. yeah, I mean, I'd love to see him start to do that early in the season, but given that the Cubs added some power, thinking how the rest of the off season goes, they don't have to be aggressive with him. Right. This next year, just let him do well at double A, get him up to triple A and get him a full year of playing third base. And if they can do that, and we know he's athletic, he's got a really strong swing. I mean, he really uses his upper body there. Insane contact rate. Love to see him play third base in 2025 full time. But, you know, Michael Bush, he has the opportunity to take over third and take over a spot in this lineup. Um, and, and I was curious that since Jed had mentioned they wanted to get left-handed bats, I'm wondering if this means they're all in on Bellinger or does it mean that I should say, are they out on a guy like Reese Hoskins or Matt Chapman if they're not focused on getting righties? It's interesting to think about. I mean, maybe Chapman's still likely because they don't have a third baseman. And if they, if they did sign Chapman and you have Bellinger first and Bush at DH, then Morrell doesn't necessarily have a place to play so I'm, I'm wondering what kind of leash they give to morell next year i'm curious as to where the positions line up and is, is there any other free agents besides bellinger that you think they might target uh bob nightingale or as we like to call him boob nightingale <laughs> oh, um yeah. he thinks he seems to think that the cubs are a possible destination for matt chapman i don't personally like that i think there's plenty in our system. Like you just said, Michael Bush could possibly play third, um, although more likely first. You've also got Matt Shaw knocking on the door eventually. Um, you know, like you said, 2025, we definitely want to see him up by then. Um, so, I mean, I would still like to sign Belly and then possibly another impact relief pitcher at the minimum. Um, they may need even like a second relief pitcher as well. So maybe yeah. a left left-handed and a right-handed relief pitching um, signing. Do you think that, and I agree with those two, it, the bullpen definitely was a, a lower, it was, it was a weakness of the Cubs. It wasn't a strength for them. I mean, early in the season, it, it did well until another point. I keep remembering these little tidbits from CubsCon because the reporters get to get there and ask questions. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of segments where the, the manager of the GM get to talk to press and talk to fans too, which is awesome. So Craig council mentioned that he wanted to use multiple different pitchers in high leverage next year. So whoever they get, they'll still rotate a lot, a lot of arms through in case those guys can perform at the high level that may not burn out. So it's good that they have council to, to do better with the back end of the bullpen to give guys rest. I mean, I think that's a strong suit. We know the Brewers have always had a good bullpen Council's former team. I do agree on on the bullpen signings as the next big move aside from Bellinger, and those those need to happen for this team to get better because it'll hopefully stabilize the back end and keep guys fresh. I'm curious of any other hitters that you like on the team, even with Bush. Let's say they did get Bellinger. Do you think they might go after a guy like Brandon Belt on a one year deal, or do you think that this all but closes a second hitter in addition to Bellinger to come to the Cubs? Um, not necessarily. I mean, they, I think, cause we don't know really what we have as a for sure thing with Michael Bush. So if we do sign Reese Hoskins, it, it'd have to be, I think on a pretty team friendly deal. Right. With, uh, I believe they call it like a pillow contract. So yeah. Depending on how he does that first year, he could either opt in, um, to that second year or hit free agency. I like Reese Hoskins a lot. I mean, he's a, again, so he's also a first baseman. Um, so that kind of negates the fact that, you know, when you trade for Michael Bush and if you sign Bellinger, um, three first, first baseman, <laughs> yeah, you have That's... like pretty much first base locked down. <laughs> yeah. Any, oh, for sure. Yeah. You That's... could also, I mean, you could, you could put him as a DH, uh, right. Reese so, um, he did hit, I was just looking up his splits. He hit, uh, lefties on a righties. He hit two thirty three. Mm -hmm. yeah that's, so, that's right i mean i'm curious if the cubs end up getting one additional hitter just for a platoon with morell maybe okay there's a lefty and morell will hit and now or wisdom or whatever but you know okay that was a righty brandon, Bell, brandon bell's my number one target aside from bellinger just because he hits righties well 
That was something that Hoyer talked about. He may only take a one-year deal. He's older. So the Cubs aren't looking for a three or four-year deal. And that's my opinion is that, you know, you're right about Boob talking about uh, Chapman. And it it almost feels like it's a two-team race, Giants one, Cubs two for Chapman. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, if Chapman goes to the Cubs, I hope it's two for two for 30, two, two for 40. I mean, yeah, I would certainly I be mind. okay with that, but... I wouldn't mind Chapman. I mean, I'm sure he's a great um, clubhouse presence. Great dude. <laughs> great dude all around, you know. Um, I just don't I, – I think our defense is is pretty it's solid. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah. It's, I mean, even straight up the middle, you know, with Horner and Swanson, you got PCA, Roman Center, you got – well, we won't really talk about Suzuki of the – He's still but a good defender. He's still, he's still a good, good defender. Yeah, we he's can no forget about that word. Yeah, minor gap. <laughs> um, so I think I think if you sign Chapman, you really have to need a solid defensive presence to add to your infield. That might be a little bit shaky because because his bat. I don't know if it necessarily plays right now. Um, right, his defense is more with really what you're valuing of him as a player. So I think we need more offense. So. Right. For me, I would be happy even just um, maybe running with Morrell at third, depending on how he does defensively. Yeah, I mean, I like Nick Madrigal defensively. Let's say he bats ninth. I don't yeah. like his offense because he he hits very few home runs. He's fast. He's going to get some singles. That will still help the team. Yeah. If you go for more power and get some strikeouts in the lineup, you have Madrigal down to the bottom of your lineup. At least you can turn the order over with a single get, you know, Happer Horn or whoever at the top of the lineup back up there, PCA. He just, you can turn the lineup over and he's good defensively. I, I'm with you. I hope that if Madrigal is playing, I hope it's not a lot, but I think he can hold hold you over a bit. And I'm hoping he do that while Morrell learns third, especially in spring. He got a little bit of reps at third, more than first in, in the winter leagues in the Dominican Republic. So I'm hoping Morrell learns third. And if he does, that opens up, Bush to DH and Bellinger to play first. And then once PCA is ready, and now you've got half PCA, Bellinger, and Bush. Four lefties in the lineup, right? Half's a switch hitter, but he mostly bats lefty, right? So Talkman can have some time, but you need to have a plethora. And obviously, if they had Brandon Belt, you know, we'll see. That's there's more righty DHs available in free agency than lefty DH first baseman types. So be great to have at 1.5 lefties in their lineup. We talked about the Dodgers having five or six lefties. You can just hit, you can hit righties a lot better. And obviously when lefty pitchers come in, you're, you got to turn the lineup over with more righties. That's where you might go with, you know, Bellinger hits lefties. Well, maybe you have Canario or who knows you're going to be able to have enough righties in the lineup to combat lefties. But when there's most of the time righties are pitching, you want to have lefty hitters in the lineup. So that's something that may be advantageous to them if they can get both Morrell and Bush. Can you imagine all the, now you got five or six really solid power hitters in the lineup. The Cubs are close. They just need to execute these last few moves. Like you said, some relievers and then they're set, but I'm glad we got to discuss this trade today. It was a massive move and it's going to add some power. The Cubs added a lefty starter in Imanaga, in Imanaga trying to say his name, right. And those are two moves within about a week of each other. So pretty quick here. Hopefully Jed is on the phone closing a few more deals before spring here. And I'm just glad there's something important to talk about. Right. Yeah. He said he says prospects, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes the podcast for today. I will see you, Zach, and everybody else on the next one. All right, talk to you later. Peace. Listen to this crowd.